Well, I'm not much of a preacher. I'm more of a person who deals in knowledge. And thank God for Pastor Tolea. He has laid foundation for me. So if you start seeing equations and funny things, don't be surprised. But he has asked me to talk about faith. And I want to talk about faith to you today from a very unusual perspective. Okay? Um, so to start that discussion, can I have five people come forward? And as you are coming forward, please pick a partner. Okay, two to one more person. Okay. No, we need more people, more people. Five people and a partner. Okay. Aha. Okay, now can the partner stay to my right? Sorry, can you have me move this to the back a bit? Okay. Can the partner stay to my right? And then the, the original people to my left. <laughs> you can't make up your mind whether you are a partner or... Okay, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, my wife is here. Um, can you please come to the board, please? It's a family enterprise, so, you know, my daughter is here, my wife is here. Only Pastor Tola can do that. Okay, please come forward, uh, darling. My delectable wife. My dollar. <laughs> okay, so please grab a marker. You're going to be writing some things on the board. So I'm going to ask the people on this side. Now, these people are Jesus. You know, there are five Jesuses here, and then you have five you know, people on this side. So I'm going to be asking these people, what is Jesus to you? And whatever they say, these people will appropriate it. So if somebody says Jesus is hamburger, you are a hamburger. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what is Jesus to you? Can we have a microphone for him? Look, let me tell you something. There's no discouragement that Satan hasn't sent to me between yesterday and today so that I won't come and tell you what I'm going to tell you today. And God is emphatic every time I've gone to him and say, what do you want me to tell these people? What I'm going to tell you today is so emphatic about it that you have to listen. And if you don't get it, please take the tape or whatever and listen over and over and over again until you get it. But you will get it. Amen. Because I'm going to simplify it. Okay. So what is Jesus to you? Jesus is my shield. Your what? My shield. Your shield. Please, baby, please write number one, shield. Yeah, next. Life. Jesus, my life. Please, my wife is writing. Don't go too fast. <laughs> I mean, isn't she delectable? So if you're wondering why I'm wearing jeans and she's wearing Gucci, that's where the money goes. <laughs> okay, next person, please. Provider. Your what? Provider. Provider. Okay. Okay, next person. Sustainer. Sustainer. It's my confidence. I wait now. <laughs> okay, so confidence. Okay, Pastor Tola, please, is anybody in this auditorium, is anybody born before 1611? Or about 1611? Anybody here? So all of you are young. Okay, now I don't preach in King James language. I preach in modern idiom. So you will not see typical interpretations from me because that's what God told me to do. That's my gift, that's my calling, to speak to the word of God in modern idiom. So you're going to hear contemporary language of the things that you are familiar with, okay? Okay, so now, what are you on the board? Shield. No, you have to speak louder. Can shield. you give him a mic? So it's a shield, right? And what are you on the board? Life. Life. What are you on the board? Provider. Provider, what are you on the board? Sustainer. Sustainer. What are you on the board? Confident. Okay. Now, do you need Jesus as shield right now? Yes, sir. Who are you running from? <laughs> okay. The next person, Jesus is life. What does that mean? Breath of life. Bread of life. Breath of life. Okay. What does your just mean? Your provider. Yes, sir. Yeah. What does that mean? Um, provide my daily needs. Daily 
Have you eaten this morning? No, not yet. You have not eaten? Is it because he hasn't provided or you chose to go and fast? Uh, I chose. That's our agreement. Okay, so, so the provision is not the problem. Yes. Okay, what's yours? Sustainer. Sustainer. What's your problem? You lack vitamin C or something. <laughs> Just to sustain me while I'm even standing here. Why are you standing? Ah, it's not yeah. me. Oh. <laughs> okay, what's yours? Confident. Okay, okay, okay. Now listen to me. These are religious answers that are coming from 21st century Christians. Do you understand? You know, we get into this religious thing and we don't even think. So if it remains small, somebody will have said Savior. Do you understand? We don't think. But you don't think of Jesus on Monday. Do you understand? You don't need Jesus as life, sustainer, provider. I'm, I'm not saying it's not all those things. But it wants a relationship with you that goes beyond all those things. Let me explain. I'm going to be teaching you physics this morning. I'm going to be using physics to teach the gospel. So listen. There's something called superposition in quantum physics. That means, for example, there's what we call, okay, hold that superposition, right? You got it? Yes. Say it after me, superposition. superposition. Okay. What it means is that a particle can exist in two states at the same time. So light is both particle and wave. Now the thing about light is that if you want to measure it as a particle, it will appear to you as a particle, but it's as if it can read your mind. When it wants to measure it as a, slave, as a wave, it appears to you as a wave. And that's not surprising because every time these people here on this side make a demand on Jesus, it appears as whatever they want or what they need. Am I making sense? Yes. So now, in theology, you call that hypostatic union that is both God and man. It's the same word as physics superposition. So they say Jesus is 100% God, 100% man. But in physics, they call that superposition. Now, so I want us to go back to this people, you know, having misled us with all these appellations. <laughs> and please tell me in actual fact, what is Jesus to you? What you need him for? today and tomorrow. All of you are going to work tomorrow and in that too? Yes. Okay, do you need someone who will tell you how to do that job, who will give you ideas, who will teach you how to do that presentation? Now, I want to show you that Jesus is all those things, and that's what he wants to be. So please, this is Jesus, one person. It's not eight people, it's not five people, it's just one person. It's just that when we make a demand with our faith, Jesus appears. So can we start from you? He's my therapist. I need to talk Thank to him. you. Yeah, he's my confidant. I talk to him. I need to okay, talk so to him. it's his therapist yeah. because she needs therapy. Isn't that so? We all need therapy because it's tough out there. Yeah. Okay. So where's your, where's your pair? So you are therapy. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, 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 don't worry, don't worry. So she makes a demand of faith on this side. What happens? What does Jesus do? Now, so remember, all this is Jesus, one entity, but it manifests to you as light, the same way light manifests to you in reading your mind. So every time we go to Jesus and we say, Jesus, ah, God, it's too tough for me. It just appears as helper. Do you understand? I don't have a child. It appears as fertility doctor. Do you understand? I don't have jobs. It appears to you as an employment agency. It just keeps on doing that. Do you understand? Now, I'm going to show you more. Uh, can we have the slides, please? Okay, so I've explained quantum state to you, I've explained acrostatic, you know, I've explained superposition. So that when unbelievers and atheists are talking to you about these things, just, just cram them and be using the words anyhow so that you can sound like you, you're a scientist or something. Do you get the joke? Okay, okay, next slide, please. I want to show you something. Okay. I told you, today is physics day. Okay. Let's give this people a round of applause first. <laughs> We're going to be writing more on the board. Okay. Remember, today is physics day. Now, it's not my fault. It's Pastor Tola's fault. Okay. Now, there are four fundamental forces of nature. You've heard of gravity, haven't you? Come on, talk to me. All of you. Okay, you've heard of gravity. You've heard of, um, you probably not, you've heard of electromagnetism. Yes. Okay, gravity is why you don't fall off. And gravity is what accounts for your weight. Okay, so if you are 100 kilograms on Earth, on the moon, you'll be about 16.6 kilograms. 
So Pastor Tola is on the moon. I'm on earth. That's why I lost 35, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, there's something called the strong nuclear force. Okay, and there's something called the weak nuclear force. Electromagnetism is why your phone, your television, this microphone, all these things that are working, electromagnetism is in charge, is the reason. Now, I can go into that for you as to the relationship of Jesus with electromagnetism because electromagnetism, there's a spectrum. And in that spectrum, there's what we call the visible spectrum, which represents Jesus because Jesus is the only manifested member of the Godhead. Do you understand? Now, now these four forces control the material world in which we live in. God loves laws. He comes up with forces and principles. Now, next slide, please. Next slide, next slide. You understand the weak nuclear force? It's what, holds, it's what accounts for the burning of the sun. Okay? The strong nuclear force is why you exist as a material body. It binds the protons and the neutrons in your, you know, in your cells. That's why you are alive. Or else you will not be. So I'm just introducing that to just impress you guys that I know physics. <laughs> okay. Now, in the same way that there are forces that control the material world, it's also the same way that there are spiritual forces and spiritual laws that control human beings. You understand? And there are two sets of laws. The first one is the law of, uh, okay, one controls the new creation, one controls, four control the new creation, one controls the new creation. Now, to understand these spiritual laws, you need to understand that there are two types of humans on earth. Can I have two volunteers, please? Two volunteers. It's interactive. No, no, you guys have come forward. Okay, you've never come forward. You've been out before. No, I want people, I want deep into the congregation. Fourth row, fifth row, sixth row. Please come forward. Okay, so these are the two types of humans on earth. Okay? You are the new creature. Because you have, you know, gray beard. <laughs> you are the old man. Remember, the Bible talks about old man and new man. Isn't that so? Okay. So he's the old man, the sinful man, and he's the new creature, the Christian. He's sinful, but it's just not accounted unto him as unrighteousness. Okay? So here we are. Um, there's only one law that controls this man. Only one law. What is that law? The law of sin and death. That's the reason he wants to sin. That's the reason he does all the things. a force controlling him. Because there's nobody who wants to die voluntarily. It's not normal for a man to drive at 200 kilometers an hour on a highway that can only take 40 kilometers an hour. There's a force controlling him. Isn't that so? Sometimes you want to sin, you don't want to sin, but you end up sinning. There's a force controlling you. Isn't that so? So that force is the law of sin and death. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to the new creation, there are four laws that are controlling this new creation. Four. Okay. Um, oh, God. I'm running ahead of my slides. Oh, I've done that. Okay. So this is man version 1.0. It was created after the original Adam. This is man version 2.0. It was created after the, new, the last Adam. Now, remember, the Bible doesn't say second Adam. Jesus is the last Adam. Because if you say second Adam, there is a possibility of the third Adam. Isn't that so? And then the Antichrist will claim that position and say, an Adam is the federal head of mankind. So everything that you are, all the source, every, you are, is the source code. Are you following the things I'm saying? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, if you don't follow me, please put up your hand, I will explain. Pastor Tola has given me grace. Okay. Now there are four laws controlling this man. And there's a difference between this man and this man. Let me explain. This man is a sinful nature man. Is made after the first Adam. So when the first Adam fed, fell, everything that he is fed from that Adam. Isn't that so? Now we are recreated after the new, after the last Adam. So the Bible calls us new creature because we never existed before. There has never been anything like us before. So it's a new thing. And I'll show you why it's it's a new thing. Can I have the slides, please? Next slide. Now, these are the four laws that are controlling this new man. Now, I put the equation there because, because I just want to. <laughs> now, I put the equations there to show you that these things, 
that you can access these laws, and the engineers among us and the mathematicians will appreciate this equation. Do you appreciate it? Okay, so go and work on it, and I'm going to give a gift to anybody who gets it. Okay? So the law of righteousness is the first law that controls this one. I will explain all the laws to you. What's the next law? The law of righteousness is a legal and constitutional status in Christ Jesus. So righteousness is not right standing. It's right standing with God, but it's not really right standing with God. And I'll explain it why it's, you know, do you have, have you heard that phrase, that righteousness is right standing with God? Okay, now, what that law, what that phrase is saying is that we were criminals. And God forgave us and put us in right standing with him. Isn't that so? Okay. Now, the problem with that definition is that God is righteous. And he's not a criminal. So righteousness cannot be right standing with God because God cannot be in right standing with himself because he's not a criminal. When you study the Bible, you discover that righteousness is the totality of your constitutional rights in Christ as granted to you by the sovereign authority of God. Let me explain. Let me explain. Let me explain. There's a difference between morality and righteousness. God is not a moral God. He's a righteous God. And righteousness is based on sovereignty. So, how many people have ever prayed for favor? All of us. Okay. Now, favor means, can I have four people? Deep into the congregation. Thank you. Pastor Tola was right about this church. Please come forward, madam. Come forward. Today is interactive day. Okay, now I want all of you to line up. You're lining up for visa or whatever it is. <laughs> okay. Um, madam, please come. Oh, sorry. No, no. Okay, she's walking by faith. I want you to be at the back of this people. Okay, so she's the last to get on the line, isn't that so? Okay. Now, when you pray to God for favor, what are you asking God for? That even though you are the last, you should be in front, isn't that so? Okay, so madam, please come forward. Okay, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Is it moral? No. It's not moral. Is it righteous? Yes. Exactly. Do you understand? Now, the reason that this is possible is because of the sovereignty of God. Nobody can question him. Nobody can ask him anything. And the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says, for example, that God chose not to save angels. But he chose to save the descendants of Abraham, who was, was his friend. Do you understand? So your salvation is not a rational decision. It is an emotional decision. For some reason, God loves us. It's not based on anything, but he saved us. So never, ever forget that your righteousness is not based on what you do or what you don't do. It's not based on what you, how good you are or how not good you are. Because Satan is going to keep on reminding you of your past. Yeah. Did you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. When he tells you that remember you have constitutional rights to be righteous in, in physics, in, 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 in ad maths, or in logic, there's an equation called PQ. When you're, how many people studied ad maths here? Have you ever seen the equation PQ? Okay, I will explain it to you. Today is today. <laughs> Please come forward. So you are P. Madam, you are Q. Okay? Who is P? Who is Q? Okay. Now, when it comes to righteousness, God came up with a PQ equation. What is a PQ equation? In logic, PQ equals to QP. Do you understand? It's interchangeable. So can you switch? So this is the righteousness of God. This is the righteousness of man. And God gave you his righteousness. So it makes no difference... Do you understand? It makes no difference what you are, who you are, what you did or anything. Do you, do you get what I'm trying to say? Because Jesus is your righteousness and you are the righteousness of God in Christ. PQ equals what? PQ equals what? 
never forget that. Madam, please. Yes, thanks. Let's give them a round of applause. Can I have my slides, please? You guys, you know, why did you guys run from physics in school? Okay. Okay. So the second law that is controlled, where is the new man? Oh, yeah, come now. Uh -uh. Is it because I'm dark? Baby, please allow me to grow beard. Okay. So this is the second law that is controlling this one. Remember I said, how many laws control the new creature? Four laws, okay? So you have the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the equation there. Okay, now, let me show you something. Next slide, please. What is this law? It is a liberation force. Because the law of sin and death is a political force that holds you down. So you need a law, a counter law, that liberates you. And that law is the law of what? Spirit of life. In Christ. It's not the law of spirit of life. It is the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Not in Jesus, but in Christ Jesus. Because Christ is the risen God. Do you understand? Jesus is the one that walked on earth. Christ is the exalted God. Do you understand? The anointed God. That's him. Okay? Now, this law is a liberation force. It frees us from the hegemony of sin. It is a direct counter to the law of sin and death. It regulates eternal life. So when you are doing all the right things, it is this law that is making you do all those things. These forces are real because the equations are real. Therefore, you can access them scientifically. Do you understand? We'll talk about that later, how you are going to do that. Next law. The law of love. Now, this law is the greatest law, actually. Because it has the capacity to override every other law. And now abided what? Faith, hope, and what? And the greatest of this is what? Love. So love is greater than faith. Do you understand? And you know, when you're a faith person, religiosity can creep in. You understand? You can be unloving and think that you are loving. Religion can do that to you. You understand? You gossip about people. They are, they, are, they are down, you stamp on them, you say nasty things about them. What are you doing? There's no love. And then you start complaining that your faith is not working. It can't work because faith works by love. <laughs> Do you understand? So the law of love, what does it control? It controls relationship, whatever the relationship is, spousal, filial, parental, humanity. You can't love God and not love humanity. Do you understand? I don't care whether the person is going through divorce or whether the person is a prostitute or whether the person is this or is that. You too, you are something. And the value, the value of that person is determined by PQ equals to what? You can't change it. Satan can't do anything about it. It's constitutional. Do you understand? Okay, next law. Law of faith, that's the equation right up there. Okay, now let me explain what that law does. That is a law that controls possibilities. Now, people sometimes don't know that they're out of faith because, they, you know, you present a situation to somebody and the first thing the person is thinking of is negativism. You present an idea and the first thing they are thinking of is, I cannot be done. Yeah. Do you understand? Because we don't know that faith is an everyday equation. We think it's only when we are sick, or when we have cancer, or when we need a baby. But faith is a day-to-day -day equation. If you are always seeing negativism, if you, are never, if you never see possibility, you won't succeed. You understand? You've got to see possibilities. What did I say? You've got to see what? And you've got to think in possibilities. That's the difference between me and many other people. So when I go for a trial session and people are complaining about this cannot be done, this cannot be done, I'm calculating in my head and I'm looking at the feasibility and the possibilities. Start thinking in possibilities. Start thinking in possibilities. Start thinking in possibilities. Now, what am I trying to say? Some of you are supposed to have started a business, but you are waiting for perfect conditions because you don't think in possibilities. And the way it functions is that God expects you to do everything that you can do, and when you have finished what you can do, then it steps in to do the impossible. 
Do you get me? Your job is not to think of how God will do it. Your job is to tell God, I need this. It's for him to figure out how he can do it. I assure you, God is intelligent enough. Do you understand me? He is powerful enough to do anything. And, I, you know, you know you've, you've probably seen my video dancing with my wife and crying and everything. If I tell you how many things I've overcome, you won't believe it. I say, you won't believe it, and you say, Amen. <laughs> I just told you to think in possibilities. Yes. You are believers. You understand? What I'm saying is that there's a place to suspend your thinking and engage your heart. Yes, do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yes. It doesn't, nothing matters. And I will show you what the law of faith can do. Can I have my slide, please? Look at it. The law of faith has a capacity to overcome the law of gravity. Do you understand? Why? Because Elijah's horsemen and horses were able to overcome gravity. In order to do that, those horses had to travel at 40,270 kilometers per hour in order to escape the gravitational pull of the earth and so that Elijah can go to heaven. Because God, gravity has to be overcome. That's how powerful the law of faith is. It can overcome, but that's not all. It can generate an alternative reality and even generate new matter. Do you understand? You don't have uterus. Law of faith can generate uterus because it's matter. You don't have a leg. The law of faith can overcome and it generates your leg. You don't have a liver. The law of faith can overcome it and generate a liver. It depends on you. The law, the law is not constrained by earthly laws. Do you understand? Then it can compress space time. What am I trying to say? What has taken some people 10 years can be done for you in one year. Lest you think that Mr. Alder is just making things up. Show me the next chart, please. I want to show you something. Look at this. When the evening came, can we read together? Yes. When the evening came, the disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set across. Yeah. What just happened now? What just happened? Faith compressed space time. Do you understand? Here you are one day, and then the next day you are there. And everybody is wondering, how did you get there? And some people say it's juju. Some people say you are fronting for somebody. Some people say you climb one mountain and everything. But what just happened is that God compressed space time for you. Do you understand me? You've been looking for a baby for some time. And you're about to give up. And it just takes one year for God to compress space time. And everybody looks at you and says, how did she do it? God compressed space time. Yeah. I started life and business with 17 naira 50 copper. You don't know what that means in dollar. It has no value in dollar. <laughs> if I can do conversion, it's not even up to one cent. Without one cent, God compressed space time. And I became a much sought out consultant in my country. And I began to consult for president, not just in my country, but in other countries. When I went to my, to, my, to, my, to, my, to my banker and I said, God told me to become a consultant. How long does it take to become a consultant? She told me 16 years. And she wasn't lying. Because here I was, I studied law, I left law, and then God is telling me to do this thing. And how am I going to do it? And the Lord said to me, he said, so I said to God, how can I wake up one day and just declare myself a consultant? And the Spirit of God told me, and Jesus stepped into the temple, and he said, and the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and he has anointed me, and that's how I became a teacher and a preacher. Some of you are waiting for perfect conditions. You are trying to do mathematical, mechanical progression. I have to work for 10 years, and after 10 years, and I will do this, and you stop calculating. Stop calculating. Stop calculating. I'm talking to somebody. Stop calculating. I'm talking to somebody. Stop calculating. I'm talking to somebody. Just believe. 
Just believe. Just believe. There is a God of miracles. There is a God who brings quails out of the Red Sea. Do you understand what I'm saying? He just brings... Uh, you can bring fish out of the Red Sea, but God has to do something that shows that he's in charge because when it's impossible, when it looks impossible, then God puts a signature. Do you understand? So the delay that you're having is because God wants to put a, a signature on your situation so that it is obvious that he did it. Yes. Remember when they called Jesus to come and wake Lazarus? What did he say? They told him he's been dead for three days and he has been dead for more time so that he will be more dead. Do you understand what I'm saying? The more dead that he is. <laughs> Do you get me? Yes. Pastor Dutola, this is a good church. Please, serve them your love. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide, next slide. You guys understand physics. <laughs> now, this is where I'm going. Faith is a knowledge tool. Because the Bible says by faith we what? We, by faith we what? So when you are presented with a situation in business or at work that you don't know, what you need to do is to appeal to the force of faith. Next slide. Let me explain what I'm saying. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure you've read this scripture. In the beginning, talk to me now. What have I done? Okay, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Now, the word, word in that scripture is what? Logos, isn't that so? Now, now I've heard you pick this and say, Logos is the written word, uh, um, Rema is the spoken word. There's nothing as ignorant as that. Now, the reason I'm telling you this was that because before I became a Christian, I was studying Greek philosophy in school. Because to study law, you have to spend a year studying philosophy and English and all sorts of things and sociology and everything. And when we came across the word logos, I was shocked when I became a Christian and the Christian was saying it's written word, as if it's handwriting. If it's ever written word, if it's ever word, it's because it's programming language. You don't get what I'm trying to say. No. Pastor Tola, please, they need your love rice. <laughs> You don't get what I'm trying to say. When you get to Genesis, the Bible says that the works of God were completed from the foundations of the world. Isn't that so? In other words, before the walls emerged, God had completed it. So what God did essentially was that he programmed the earth, and then he went to sleep. And then over time, the programming began to manifest, and began to manifest, and began to manifest. Now here's the problem. God has written a program about you, but you lost faith because you can't see it. But the works of God were completed before what? The foundation of the world. So that baby that you want, that job that you want, that wife that you want, that husband that you want, you, oh, it's already there, it's already... Oh, God. Oh, God, oh, God. You guys don't get it. How many people think the book of Revelations is bizarre? How many people? Please just be honest with me. You think it's bizarre. It's bizarre to you because it's a 4D equation. It's not a 3D equation. Do you understand? It is physics. That, oh God, oh God, okay. Oh God. Listen, John saw an animal, a creature, that could see the front and the back at the same time. Isn't that so? In 4D, that is not strange. It is not strange to see the future and the present and the, and the past at the same time. So, whatever you want in 4D already exists because in 4D, there's neither time, no future, no past, no present. Everything is. Do you understand what I'm saying? In physics, there's something called time dilation. Time delays things. So while you are waiting in 3D, it's because of time. Do you understand? It's not because what you want doesn't already exist. Do you understand what I'm saying? And then we give up and cancel the order. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Bible says before you speak, God already heard you. And while you yet speak, what does he do? He hastens to perform. 
But God does not dwell in time. He does not understand time. It's not a dimension for him. Why? And I need to tell you more physics to explain this to you. I pray I get through all these slides. The faster you go, the slower time becomes. So every time you get on the plane and you travel on the plane, when you come back, you're actually younger than the rest of us. It's just that it's milliseconds, like billionth of a billionth of a second. Now, if it's possible for you to approach and travel at the speed of light, or close to the speed of light, because that's virtually impossible, okay? What will happen is that if you've gone for, say, 100 years or 10 years, all those of us on earth will have died. You will come back younger than the rest of us. Now, this is where it gets interesting. What is God? Is he light? Yes. Does he dwell in light? Yes. Therefore, God can never grow old. He can never grow old because he's light. Do you understand what I'm saying? Remember, light stops at the speed of light. Uh, sorry, uh, age, time stops at the speed of light. So God can never grow old. He's got time on his side. That's why he's looking at you. So you're counting one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. But to God, it's one billionth of a 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 millisecond. That is why when the, your prayers are answered, it looks as if, oh, it was just yesterday. Because when your prayers are answered, you move from 3D to 4D. Do you understand? Where there's neither present, nor past, nor future. Let me explain it to you so that you'll understand this thing that I'm saying. So there was a guy called Nene Moses. I don't know if you know the guy. He lives down my street. Okay? So the guy gets audacious. And he says he wants to see the, 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 the manifestation of God. Isn't that so? Okay, so I want somebody to come forward. I'm going deep into the congregation now. One person come forward. I want to show you something. Please come, 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 come. Please come. Your name is what? Elisha. No, 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 no. Your name is Moses. Oh. <laughs> okay, please come. Okay, so the Bible says that God hid Moses. So hide behind this, this place, right? I want you to see this construction because I want you to read the Bible differently from today. Okay? So God hid Moses. You're not, why are you standing? You're not hiding. Okay. Okay, I want you to tell me the possibility of this. So Moses is hiding in a rock. Isn't that true? And the Bible says that God covered his face with his hand. Isn't that so? So elongate my hand in your imagination. So my, face, my hand is going back, right? Then at the same time, the same God who is covering his face with his hand is also passing in front of him. Do you understand? Then at the same time, Moses saw the backside of God. So he covered his face in the past. He walked in front of him in the present. And he saw God's backside in the future. All happening at the same time. Do you understand? So in 4D, what those of us, like those of us that are in 3D, when we think of these things, it's impossible. It's impossible because you don't understand physics. And God understands physics. The past, the present, and the future are linear as far as God is concerned. They are all together. They exist at the same time. Even those animals, the Bible, those creatures, the Bible says that they can look within. Do you think they are doing x-ray? No, it's not extra. What he's talking about is that these beings have a way of looking into a 3D world. That's why the Bible says you are surrounded by a crowd of witnesses. You can't see them, but they can see you. Because in higher dimension, you can see lower dimension. So when God sees you, he doesn't see you as you see you. When God sees you, he doesn't see you as your neighbor sees you. When God sees you, he doesn't see you as people condemn you. In his mind, you are in the by prototype of Jesus. That is what he sees. PQ equals what? PQ equals what? Now, Moses, can you please come out? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Now, please give him a round of applause. <laughs> give me the next slide. Give me the next slide. Don't go yet. I still want to see whether you have a slide. <laughs> now, concerning Jesus, the Bible says, in whom is eating what? All what? And what? No, 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 no. You guys are misreading your Bible. Read it again. In 
Now, I forgot to tell you that Logos means the creative intelligence of divinity. So the person who is, it, listen, you guys didn't study this thing. Now, all the, the, the guy who, that God gave the revelation of the Logos was a gentleman called Heraclitus. He was an eccentric guy, crazy guy. He didn't understand what he was dealing with, so he called the Logos a principle. And he it refers to reason, word, all those things. He's trying to explain this thing that God has shown him that he doesn't understand. Heraclitus lived about 500 years before Jesus or before John. The revelation of John was the fact that he made a quantum leap of faith in saying that the Logos is not a principle but a person, and his name is Jesus. Therefore, the person that is creating in Genesis who? It's Jesus. Jesus is the one who created the universe and everything. Now, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was brooding. Now, it wasn't angry, and it wasn't angry with Jesus, and it wasn't complaining about your love rice. The word brood there just means that it was doing calculations, mathematical calculations. So while Jesus was doing the conceptualization and coming up with all these impossible things, it was the Holy Spirit that was trying to figure out the mathematical calculation and say the earth must have mass if you want gravity and everything, and begins to calculate all these things. But all I want you to see is that the person that created the universe, you and me, everything that you can see is Jesus. The only reason he needed the God that was when he needed intellectual property license to create us. Because he made us in the image of God and man. In the image of God. Now, give me my slide, please. Give me my slide. So in this, no, go, go back, go back. We are too... Now, now, the Bible says that in this Jesus are hidden all the treasures of what? Wisdom. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Because when you talk to Christ, it says spiritual knowledge. What is spiritual knowledge? Spiritual knowledge just means knowledge you don't know anything about. Is physics, spiritual, is it physics knowledge in this scripture? Does it qualify as knowledge? Does economics qualify as knowledge? Business management, does it qualify as knowledge? Strategy, does it qualify as knowledge? Policy, does it qualify as knowledge? So why do you think God or Jesus is an illiterate who doesn't understand your business, doesn't understand your profession, doesn't understand engineering, doesn't understand everything? In him I hid what? All of wisdom and knowledge. What I want you to access is that Jesus, not my savior, not my life, not my confidant, not my redeemer, we know. I'm looking for Jesus on Monday. Give me the next slide, please. Now, people think that there's one dimension of Jesus in the Bible, but there are four dimensions. The first dimension of Jesus in the Bible is God the government. You see him in Revelation. He's the king of kings. He's the lord of lords. That's Jesus the government. Isn't that so? Yes. Then the next dimension is Jesus the businessman. Now, remember the venture capital case study in the Bible, the parable of the talents? Yes. It's a venture capital case study, like a Harvard case study. And those of you that are doing business, just know that God is particular about returns on his money. Do you understand? It's particular about returns on his money. He's a hard-nosed businessman. The problem most times is that people don't know that whether they are dealing with Jesus, a compassionate, the one who forgives, the one who heals, and the one who is a businessman. The one who is a businessman is the one who gave you the money for the business. You can't throw it away. Because if you throw it away, you collect it from you and give it to somebody who understands money. Do you understand what I'm saying? Let, let me, you know, because some of you believe too money. You know, I used to give out a lot of money when I was a younger man, you know, and you ask me for anything, 100,000 and everything, but I didn't value money. So one day I needed 100,000 naira. It was nothing to me. And I waited for this money, the money never come. So I went to God, and he said to me, do you appreciate 100,000 naira now? I said, I do. And then the money came. Some of you are not having what you need because you trivialize money. You trivialize what God is given to you. Don't do that. Some of you are ruining your business by giving credits to those you know cannot pay. Do you understand? How do you give credit to somebody who's not credit worthy? How do you give credit to somebody who has cheated you, came back, cheated you, came back, and is pleading Jesus in the name of God? You know, some people know scriptures when it comes to that kind of thing. They know it more than you. So there's, here's my slide again. 
So there is Jesus, a compassionate, is the one who heals, is one who, 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 um, who forgives, is the one who feeds us. Can I have some water, please? Thank you. I'm grateful. You have to know which Jesus you are dealing with. 